Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon Soraki. I'm the creator and writer of Avalon Comic. You can find us on linktree.com slash Avalon Comic. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. <laughs> Fucking A. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic writer and creator of a new series that I just happened upon most recently. You can find it on Global Comics. The series is called Avalon, and it is a pretty amazing series at that, I must say. Joined by the ever-talented Brandon Starochi. How are you doing today? Good. How are you today? Doing good. Doing good. Yeah. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am Brandon Staraki. Avalon is basically my first creative thing that's out there. I've been a creative person, I feel like my whole life coming down to, you know, high school, even even middle school age, my me and my buddy growing up and all that stuff, we would always make uh, YouTube videos and fun little stupid things as kids do, I guess. But as I got a little bit older, before Avalon was Avalon, I had the idea of this zombie story that I wanted to kind of get out there, not knowing anything uh, from anything. I had a bunch of notes written down i stored them away because i didn't know what to do with them many years later i meet alan and pitched the idea to him and we were kind of working on the 1282 kind of production thing uh so we can kind of get that moving alongside with it trying to find different creative avenues to do this avalon kind of was born at that point and here we are you know i'm working on avalon i'm working on a couple other kind of uh short uh screenplays and other comic books as well so just really trying to move in quicker in the creative thing but avalon is my first creative thing that's out there right now what's the elevator pitch of avalon avalon is a post-apocalyptic comic book we kind of generate it towards the fact that anybody could pick this comic book up and relate to anybody you know obviously every everybody's not into zombies uh like that but we want to make it so anybody could pick it up and relate to any character so there's no real main character per se it's more journey amongst the, the whole family that you meet at once which is the castle family and you watch them grow and you watch how chaotic their life was before the apocalypse even started and it very disarranged and you kind of learn that they have troubles one of the brothers is far away or further away hasn't been around for quite some time you know they have problems and then boom you get hit with the apocalypse and now they have to try to find ways to link back up and put their differences to the side for a moment so they could survive so then what is the most misunderstood aspect about the zombie apocalypse genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand i think people look at it the wrong way you know i'm a big fan of the genre i guess i could tell you this i'm a fan of the genre because it lets it shows who people really are, mm -hmm. you know, because when you really have your back up against the wall and you you're take civilization away from it, you take law and order out of it, you really get people for who they really are and who they are deep inside. It really comes out, especially when your family's survival's on the line, you have other people, or if you're just a bad person in general, like it, that stuff comes out because there's less law and order. But it's those aspects that I really enjoy about the apocalypse setting and zombie setting like that. And especially in a creative kind of element of it, you could really bring these characters down or you could bring these characters up and just do a bunch of different things with that world being the way it is. So you mentioned part of your team, but who is the entire team working together with you to put Avalon together? Because like, I love the black and white art style with the, the mm. hints of red right, with the blood and things like that. I think that's mm. an awesome touch. You have a, a nice clean style overall. So it's not not difficult to read the lettering is is easy to read as well mm -hmm. too like you could you could do a lot of different things with a zombie apocalypse and screwing up the lettering i think in terms of the font type is a yeah. huge misstep for a lot of i think beginner creators so who's the team around you and uh, i'll stop gushing about the comic <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so it's just it's me right now. Obviously, I'm the creator and writer. I had Alan on for season one. He kind of branched off because, as I mentioned before, the 1282 label or production, we're kind of working on different kind of creative uh, elements to it. So he's working on other things right now. He was a big chunk of ish or season one to kind of get that moving. Callie Oberlander, we just added as kind of like another collaborating writer. So she's going to be there for a little bit here and there, kind of helping out with big points and, and etc. And she has her own podcast that she's done as well. It's called the Tia and Rio show. Uh, it's a very good podcast. I, you know, I kind of bring it out there because it is good. It is basically the reason she's on this thing as well is because I, I really enjoyed that podcast. Uh, she's worked on a bunch of short films, feature films. So she kind of has that experience and she actually 
I lived in LA for a little while, came back to Erie. So it was kind of easy for us to do that now that she is in Erie. Um, and of course, Demetrius is the artist. Everything you see visually is all him. He does a phenomenal job, I believe. We're very fortunate to have him uh, part of this journey because you know, the, the style that he brings really just solidifies what Avalon is. Um, I don't think anybody could do it as good as he does. And I'm, we're just very pleased to have him a part of the team. That was the one thing I noticed about it from the sample pages to going through the whole archive of, of from on global, global comics as well, mm -hmm. too. I, th I thought it was just really well done overall. So there, there was, I have, I have no notes whatsoever because it just was a nice fluid story. It was very consistent. There was no real pauses or breaks that left you wondering about anything really per se, at least when I quickly went through it. What was a piece of artwork that you got back from Demetrius that was way better than what you had written on the page? Actually, a lot of the stuff recently he's been giving me has been way better than I originally anticipated. <laughs> um, like a couple of them that are on the Kickstarter right now, there's a page that, that comes up in issue five that one of the characters, you know, uh, as you read issue one, you figure out a character is bitten and it's kind of inevitable that this is going to happen he's going to you know something's going to happen to him we show it over the course of the couple issues that the change and what happens to people when they are bit uh that's kind of like a different approach that we wanted to focus on as close friend you you watch the transition and then to get to the page what he does with the page is the blood he uses the blood a lot now uh at, to kind of outline outline the panels which is awesome to me and that's not even on the script that's just something that he kind of comes up with uh, on the spot and there's a lot of things with the recent issues that he he kind of reads the script that he's given and he tells me he's like i got a cool idea here and he sends me the pencils of his idea and 99 percent of the time we're rolling with it because it's just that good so you know with that, it's just awesome to have that relationship build over the the last few years here and we just we kind of get each other and he knows what i want without even me writing it down in the script at this point, you know, but it, it's awesome. It's awesome to have him. I love collaborations with multiple people. It really showcases uh, a collaboration and talent and to communicate as well, too, both yeah. from an art perspective as well as a, a writing perspective. It's not just like take everything at face value. Right, exactly. And and that's actually, uh, you know, from issue one, when you look at issue one and to issue two, it's the same artist, you know, but he's he's grown and and that just shows how much of our, uh, our relationship has grown as well, which is great. You know, the, the issue one art is still good. It's just different, you know, and issue two, when he kind of pitched the idea, I was kind of nervous at first when he's like yeah I, I kind of evolved i have a new style and and all that and i was like mm, I, i'm a big consistent person so i didn't want too much change and when he pitched a new art style i loved it obviously and you know it just had avalon written all over it mm. and that's going to be the style going forward obviously and one of the cool things that we're doing with that too is next year we're going to be remaking issue one with the yeah. new art style so that's one of our big things that we're going to be doing with our trade paperback volume one coming out next year as well so it's going to kind of be one big thing and it's going to be a fun thing that we push for next year i was almost thinking and this kind of just popped into my mind and you can take it or leave it however you want you, you you're the creative team behind this but i was thinking as the art style evolved the zombies evolved as well and this dystopian style evolved as well too with that as a kind of like a, a growing <laughs> scale but that's just me well like, and, and it's funny you said, I won't say too much, but but that is a big thing that's going to be different with our infection, zombie, whatever you want to call it, uh, because, you know, it's it's great. We had the traditional stuff back then. I'm a big traditional guy. I like the zombie genre for what it is. Obviously, we wanted to change it up a little bit because it's been done so many times, but our zombies are going to be a little bit different. You know, obviously, you could tell they're a little bit different because of how they look with the scratches or uh, specific scratches around their eyes. So we kind of leave that question. If You know, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll, you'll look back and go, oh, yeah, there are some scratches. And then you'll see that in issues to come of what's different about them. And it's going, they're going, they are the, how you said the evolve thing. It is definitely a part of the story. Uh, we wanted to kind of progress that alongside of the family you meet and the other characters you're going to meet as well. So those, all those things are going to be moving forward. The infection, the world, the family, all those things are going to be growing and, and evolving as the story evolves, which is, which is one of the big aspects that we wanted to kind of do with this story compared to other stories in the zombie genre. Does writing energize you or does it drain you? 
Uh, it, it could do a little bit both, a little bit of both. I think for the most part, it does energize me, especially when you get to, in the groove of things, when you start really laying down some uh, some content, you're, it gets exciting, you know, uh, watching the story kind of progress and watching certain characters go through things that you've had in your head for a while and actually getting it on paper is fun. Um, but there's times where you get stuck, right? You know, and, and then that's the times where you get, maybe you get a little bit drained there and it's just like you need, you. but that's when it's important for you to stop take a step back, you know, go outside, enjoy the sun, stuff like that, you know, and then go on a walk. You know, I've noticed that for me, at least walks help a lot, you know, listening to some sort of, you know, music that puts you in that kind of, in, obviously in our setting, it's the apocalypse kind of vibe, you know, so you'll listen to stuff like that on your walks and kind of, you just start, think, you know, just exercise, think, and, but yeah, I think a little bit of both, but more so, I think it energizes me when I kind of get going on it. So what weapon would you take into a zombie apocalypse? I mean, I, I think it's just a basic gun, sure. But, you know, if I'm going to be traditional in the zombie kind of world, it has to be, you know, the Colt Python with, you know, just just for the cool effect. You know, the Rick Grimes cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to have that good iconic look there, right? But it would be some kind of gun, you know, obviously. But I asked the same question to the author from Z, Z for Zombie as well, too, um, Max Brooks. Well, after I butchered his name, and that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> he goes, well, you just got to bring a sword to it because bullets run out. So you might as well just start hacking and slashing, you know. That's actually a good point, too. I've heard that a lot from people where they're like, yeah, like you said, bullets run out and then just be very good with a sword. But, you know, what happens when you come across somebody who still has bullets? I don't know. <laughs> it's just you got you to gotta be smart with it, I guess. Right. Well, okay. Well, you, you don't take a gun to a knife fight or something. Right. Whatever, whatever, uh, knife to a gunfight. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know, looking at your yourself as a creative person, since you talked about yourself growing up and, and being creative from the very beginning into where you currently are now, how have you evolved creatively? Uh, I think uh, a lot. And that's just because of, you know, I give a lot of credit to the people around me. I, I like to be a sponge as much as I can. I like to hear experiences. I like to hear uh, things that people have gone through. And having people around you is the most important thing, I think. And it's definitely helped me in my whole journey. Uh, we, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, not knowing anything. I haven't done any classes or anything like that. It's just kind of learning trial and error a little bit. Uh, but having good people around you that have experienced stuff like this in the past and kind of know where the direction is supposed to be is the most important thing. It's just trusting your work and trusting the people around you, I think, is the most important thing. And that, like I said, that that's what's helped me kind of grow over the time. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Uh, just to keep going, you know, it's definitely a tr everybody, I feel like, says it, but to truly keep going, uh, you do want to keep going in these kind of circumstances. You're, you're going to hit walls. You're, you're going to hit things that kind of stumble you a little bit. But at the end of the day, as long as you keep moving forward, it's going to come out. And and that's the kind of idea that uh, with Avalon, the, the only reason we have Kickstarters is to get it out in a timely fashion, right? Um, it No matter what, Avalon is always going to come out. I'm always going to find a way to get it out. Uh, but obviously without the Kickstarters and without everybody's help and kind of support, it takes a lot longer to do that. You know, Avalon has been a part of me for a while. Um so, like I said, it's the goal, it's the end goal, but having the Kickstarters there, having people supporting us and, and liking the material that we're kind of giving, it helps it get out in a timely fashion. And I want to see it come out faster and faster as time goes on. You know, uh, last year we got two issues out. This year, our goal is to get four issues out, which we're on pace for it. You know, as long as this one kind of succeeds, issue six is going to come out at the end of the year. And then we get our trade paperback of the first full season, you know, nice. first full arc. So, you know, we're, we're kind of moving and grooving. So that, that's that's the good thing about us right now. We have some support right now. We're looking for more people to kind of jump on the bandwagon. So anybody who wants to join. Running a Kickstarter campaign is like a second job. And the fact that you this is now your fourth campaign as well, too, is, is amazing in its own right. How have you changed your tiers and your different types of products that you're offering this time around, say, compared to other campaigns you've run in the past? Yeah, uh, issue one was really just trying to learn Kickstarter. Alan knew what it was, but it was so long before he saw it. Uh, so we had to kind of learn Kickstarter for what it was last year. It was really just a trial and kind of promoting it to really friends and family because we weren't public yet at that point. Uh, we didn't really have much to kind of show. So it was, you know, it was just really trying to pitch it to fa family and friends and then kind of a few people along the way. 
and locally, most importantly as well. Uh, issue two, we kind of grew a little bit because we were physically out. People knew of us. We were getting out there. We're going to events and having issue two and having the art style evolve as well. It helped us out in a way where, you know, it, it appeased the eye a little bit more with the blood that he kind of evolved with and really showcasing the intense kind of moments to each Kickstarter has been different. I feel like every single time you do it, it's a new time in the year. It's a new time in life. So it just changes, I think, almost weekly or maybe even daily at some point. So you got to like kind of be up to date with what you're doing. Like this last Kickstarter right now, it's the newest thing we're doing. It's a raffle basket. Anybody who pledges for a reward at any dollar amount will have their name to uh, possibly win this raffle basket that we're doing. Obviously, if you spend more, you're going to get more slots on that spin wheel. With this raffle basket, you're getting all issues, one through five physical signed. You're getting all the variant issues signed physical and you're going to get all the exclusive uh posters and material that we've had from our past kickstarters that we do not sell anywhere else we've only sold them on the kickstarters but the only opportunity you're gonna be able to get these again is through this raffle basket we're just trying to really sell people on the idea of the, you know because who doesn't like raffle baskets you know it's, it's fun and it's a cheap way to kind of hey put a dollar in you'll put your name in right that's kind of the newest thing we've done you know and over time we've added kind of exclusive things and actually another new thing we did with this one is Demetrius is from Greece, so it's kind of far away. So this is only going to happen uh, not that much. We're doing one of one original pencils of the characters. We have, uh, I can kind of show them because we already have them, which is a good thing for people who <laughs> question a lot. Demetrius has done original pencil work for each character. Each page will have a duo character. Uh, this is Andy and Miller right here. And they're one of ones. They're signed by him as well. We're going to get a uh, certificate, you know, authenticity. And one of them was already sold. So there's four left. So get them while you can. It's like I said, it's going to be very rare that this happens uh, because he is in Greece. He's, he's very far away. So it's not going to be like this is a, a very common thing. So those are the two big new things that we've done for this Kickstarter coming up. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oof. I don't know. I, I really, I really don't know. Like just any kind of language, like, I guess just. Got to stop it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, you, you stumped me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess just in general, uh, I'll just speak in a general term. Uh, lately, since I've started this whole thing, it's been very important of how you kind of show yourself, you know, and kind of show who you are as a person and, and talking to people and I guess language in, in, in that sense too is, is very important for people on how they perceive you and the projects that you've got that you have as well. I guess, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess like <laughs> there's so much things that I've been told in the past. There's so many things I've learned in recent history as well, like uh, from Alan himself, you know, a lot of wise words. He's a few years older than I am. So, and he's been in kind of the industry as well in the music aspect of it, you know, so he's kind of been in a trial and error kind of spectrum of things. So when, there's times where you kind of are sitting there, you're, you're trying to work on your project, you're really trying to get it out there. And then you're, you're getting overly ambitious and you're, you're putting, goals that aren't possible to meet out there. And then he would kind of give me those, those things like you got to slow it down a little bit, you know, let's take it easy. It's doing good. It's getting out there. People are kind of doing it. We still have to pitch it. We still have to uh, market it and all that. And, and with him doing that as well. And when it really started clicking with me is when Callie was telling me very similar things so that, and then when I've heard it from people doing other interviews as well, I think it's, it's me kind of connecting the dots and people saying same things in different ways. And I think it's very important to kind of hear what everybody's saying in that regard and applying it to yourself as a person and applying it into your own kind of creative project, whatever that might be. And just in general as well, like it, it just helps to be a critic of yourself, hearing people out and don't take it personal. And that's kind of one thing that I've learned over the years, just growing up as well. You know, I'm not a very, I don't take things very personal in that category. I'm a very, you know, I could be sarcastic. I could be very fun in that way. Uh, I'm not, I don't take a lot of things personal that people say. And even if they're being personal, I don't, I don't almost care really, but you know, just hearing people out, taking their criticism and applying it to your life and your projects as well. What challenges do comic creators face in today's world that needs to be addressed? 
it's unfortunate right now because as a comic book creator, especially as an indie comic book creator, uh, you have many hats to wear. You have to be the creator. You have to be the writer, sometimes even the artist. Uh, and you have to be a marketer. You have to be social media advisor. You got to do it all. Anybody who is trying to do it or thinking about doing it, they need to know that before going into it. I think it's, I think it makes the road a little bit easier uh, at the start, you know, because those are things that I had to learn over time. And which again, goes back to my statement earlier, just keep going kind of mentality. Uh, I have that in me. So I just wanted to keep it going anyways. But I think it makes that whole uh, transition and process a little bit easier for anyone who's thinking about it. Um, and another thing, I guess, on top of that is find out ways there's a lot of ideas out there. You know, there's a lot of similar ideas, but there's a lot of similar genres and different ideas. You want to find a way that you could best explain what makes your comic book different than everything else that's in, in the pool of water there or in the big ocean that's there indie comics. So how does you set your Avalon apart from similar genres, say like from The Walking Dead, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, and obviously being a huge fan of The Walking <laughs> Dead comic and show, it, you know, I don't want it. I, I love the show but I don't want it to be like, oh, look, it's the next Walking Dead. I want it to be, oh, this is Avalon, right? And that's the big goal for us. And although it's going to be very hard to kind of break that because zombie comic, zombie comic, you know, The Walking Dead did it great. They did it very great. So it's always, things are always going to be com almost compared to that. But one of the things that we focus on being different is really grounding our comic in as much reality as you can in a fictional world as a zombie apocalypse. And that goes down to the character development, the world uh, surrounding them, and the infection at most. Way in the beginning of this whole process, Alan and I were kind of going back and forth on the idea of how this infection is, what could cause this infection, what are real things out there to date that could literally do this. And, and we found things, they're not in the story yet. We don't know if they're gonna be in this particular story of Avalon, maybe a different story that kind of ties in with it, but we, we do know what caused the infection here in Avalon. And so just that realism and, and focusing on mental health, physical setbacks, people deal with physical issues and mental health on a day-to-day -day basis. And to really shine a light on that in a story of an apocalypse or people, you know, sickness and, you know, co uh, society collapsing, I think is very, very important. A lot of people, I think, try it and then they go, they get lost in their main story arc and plot. I think this is our main story arc and plot is really mental health and physical setbacks. And these are going to be big points of the story going forward that characters have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which leads to that question way back then when uh, that I asked myself is how would I survive in the zombie apocalypse? So I want anybody who picks this up to kind of feel that and go, oh, I relate to this character. So this could be my outcome kind of deal. How has Global Comics helped you promote Avalon? Global Comics has definitely helped in, in a way of kind of giving a platform, uh, giving us space to share what we got. And we do have issues one and two on there for free for people to read and kind of see what we're about. And I think Kind of putting those two issues in there together, I put them both in there rather than just the one because I wanted to show the different art style or this the one from issue two that's going to be the art style going on and, and kind of give you a little bit more of the story. It shows you a little bit more of the differences that you're getting in Avalon compared to other zombie uh, projects that have been out there. It had helped with the platform, I guess, you know, really trying to get people out there. Uh, we've had many, many people read it, the whole dashboard it shows you on the, so, so that's great for us. You know, I, I like to see that. I like to see those numbers go up as well, uh, but it's fun. It, it, it definitely helps. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? And that can be personal or professional. Uh, I guess if I'll go the professional route because it's the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, as mm -hmm. mentioned in our Kickstarter as well, has a big inspiration on me and how I kind of take my creative journey. Love all of his movies. Um, he does a very, very good job of making these characters feel real and even putting them in on paper that seems like a boring kind of scene somehow makes it a great scene. And uh, really making these, like I said, these characters feel like they're real, having real day problems, acting real. And and that's kind of what one, one of the big things I want to take from him as a creator and apply into all my projects that I'm working on as well. And just really adding depth to the characters as well. It, he does phenomenally in all of his projects. And that is another thing I want to take from him and apply it into our uh, kind of creative things that we work on and really add depth to the characters that I create in the future. And, and the ones that are already here as well. 
from a professional standpoint, you have done four Kickstarter campaigns. You have been successful on, on all of them. And you're doing very well from a creative standpoint in creating an amazing comic with Avalon. And I can't wait to see what you're doing in the future, as you alluded to earlier in the interview as well, too. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, that, that can go any way for anybody. I feel like, I feel like there's so much more to be done. You know, um, I want to do so much more. So to kind of tag myself as successful, I guess I, I wouldn't do that yet. You know, uh, we want to be able to use Kickstarter as kind of an exclusive deal and do it and minimize that to just one or two times a year. So, um, to, until we kind of start meeting that goal, it, I wouldn't even say it. And even then I'm going to postpone it again. So it's, I'm going to always look for the future me and what I'm working on in the future uh, project wise. Uh, so I'll probably never be successful in my eyes. I'm always going to want to do more. I'm always going to want to create more and do better things and more things. And so uh, with that, I, I understand that we had successful Kickstarters and things in the past and getting these things out there, but there's so much more that could be done. And that's kind of where my mind is at. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? By hitting them head on. You know, uh, one of the big things I failed to mention, you know, uh, talking about failures, <laughs> when we originally were going to release our issue one script, it, it was awful. It was, it was, I couldn't believe we were going to publish it and uh, move forward with it. Alan and I kind of took it back. And as soon as we took it back, we ended up expanding that, original issue one into the three issues that you see and can read to date that are out now to kind of put that in perspective the one that we're going to publish that we pulled back that was also 24 pages and to kind of think that we crammed three issues into one originally blows my mind and i can't believe we're going to do it and that, that just is horrible i hate i hated that i'm glad we ended up pulling that back i wouldn't say a failure kind of like oh you failed kind of thing but it was a good eye opener for me being young in the creative industry and kind of learning these things as we're going along here, but grabbing that before it could have been something terrible and fixing it and making it into something that we got today. And for the most part, we've gotten really, really good feedback, which we're very, very glad we pulled that one back because we got so much more content and material out of it and three issues than we could have uh, just by releasing it in one full issue. The younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator, comic creator, or maybe something creative that you've inspired them on their path to being a creative person. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think just simply doing what you love to do is inspiration in itself. Finding what you want, you know, from year, many years ago, I figured out that I wanted to be some sort of creative. I didn't know what exactly, but I knew I had a creative mind and I wanted to do creative things. And then as time went on and as I got older and, as you know, meeting Alan and other people like Callie and Demetrius and, and his perspective as well, it makes it easier for me to know who I am as a creator and who I am as a person as it goes on. Just simply fulfilling what you know needs to be done. And if you're a creative person, just do it. You know, I work a day job now. I do whatever I can to kind of hopefully make the comic or creative world my day job eventually, you know, and just really grinding and getting those things done and moving towards that goal and direction is, I think, what would inspire me if I was the generation below me, if I saw somebody doing this and kind of seeing people who have done it, you know, you've, you've heard many celebrities over time, just saying, just keep going, just keep doing what you love. And it pays off eventually. So it's kind of that mindset. I think that inspires people underneath people. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? It would be Brandon's chaotic journey because it has been chaotic <laughs> and uh, the soundtrack that could go anywhere. I will, I will say, I'm just going to, because again, I, I'm looking at it and I love the soundtrack of this movie. I'm going to say it would have to fit in a 1969 kind of soundtrack mm. uh, with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The soundtrack that he had in that movie blows my mind. I love I loved the whole soundtrack. It's, it's, it's fun. Uh, it adds those quirky kind of moments as well. It, you know, or with the music, it kind of keeps that kind of tempo going. It And a lot of the songs, you know, the tempo are pretty fast as well. So it's just a lot of chaos, a lot of tempo, and a lot of kind of high-speed things. So I think that kind of genre of music there and my kind of Brandon's chaotic journey there, comic book. Well, Brandon, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I had a fun time. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign? 
When does it end and anything else you'd like to promote? Our Kickstarter ends June 27th of this month. And you can find us anywhere on any social media platform, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Patreon as well. And whenever you find those social media outlets, we have link trees attached to all of them. Uh, our Kickstarter is on there. Our global comics link is on there. All the other social media is on there. Even TikTok. I, I finally caved and made a TikTok. <laughs> Avalon has a TikTok. Find that on there as well. But we're on all social media platforms. Message us. Feel free to message us. Get in contact with us. Whatever you want to do. But most importantly, Kickstarter is out there. It ends the 27th, as I mentioned. We're trying to meet our goal here so we can get issues four and five out and meet our year goal, pursue issue six at the end of the year. We're 60% right now. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-O-W, not the number two, because that's a different website you don't want to go to. Our YouTube channel, though, is a lot more updated than our website because the website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons and I'm only one person, which is two geeks talking dot podbean dot com. Or if you don't like Podbean, then go to your iTunes or iHeartRadio or anywhere you get your favorite podcast streaming services and just search for two geeks talking. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.